I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Good evening, it's 6pm and welcome to Jews & Co. I'm Emily Carver, I'm standing in for Michelle this evening for you. So tonight, a new poll shows that nearly half of all Tory voters want to nationalise the energy industry. Why would they want to do that? Would that solve the misery for millions of people when their energy bill heads north towards £4,000 a year? Were energy companies run so well the last time they were in government hands? I don't think so. But do you think renationalisation is the answer? We're all witnessing our bills soar. Could taking it back into government hands actually help us out here? Would it bring energy bills down? Also, could we be heading towards a general strike? I don't believe we've had a general strike since 1926, although, of course, there was a huge number of strikes during the 70s. Anyway, two of the country's biggest unions want coordinated strike action to cause maximum impact for them and presumably maximum misery for the rest of us. And with the cost of living crisis, is it in the national interest to allow synchronised strikes? I'm not so sure. And we've all been horrified with recent crimes, the shooting of nine-year-old Olivia Pratt-Corbell in Liverpool and, of course, the stabbing of pensioner Thomas O'Halloran while riding his mobility scooter. Shocking stuff. Now one police chief wants tasers to be part of the standard safety kit issued to officers to fight crime. Would this be a move away from policing by consent into a different way of keeping law and order? Would it be a little bit too authoritarian for you sitting at home? Anyway, all of that to come tonight on Jews & Co with me, Emily Carver. But first, the latest news headlines with the lovely Polly. Emily, thank you. Good evening. The top story tonight, NASA has postponed the launch of its new moon rocket over an issue with one of its engines. The uncrewed rocket is the world's most powerful to date and was due to propel a test capsule far from Earth into the moon's orbit. But engineers said an engine bleed was a problem and they've called off the launch for today. They added the first opportunity for the next launch attempt will be this Friday, depending on how that engine problem proceeds. The Artemis 1 mission is aiming to prove people can go to the moon for longer and more sustainably than ever before. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson emphasised the need for safety checks. It's just illustrative that this is a very complicated machine, a very complicated system, and all those things have to work. And you don't want to light the candle until it's ready to go. Well, here on Earth, in the UK, the final week of campaigning in the Conservative leadership contest. Liz Truss's team saying she favours targeted support to ease the cost of living crisis. However, the Tory leadership candidate says she's not ruling anything out and says it wouldn't be right to announce plans before she's seen Whitehall analysis. Global chief executive of market research company Ipsos, Ben Page, says she's under pressure. The public now wants to see more, more action and more spending. She's slightly against the grain of the things that she says she stands for, but she's probably going to be forced to do it when she turns her attention from the small number of people who are, of course, choosing the leader of the Conservative Party to the electorate as a whole. Meanwhile, Environment Minister and Team Rishi supporter Victoria Prentice told GB News the former Chancellor believes help should go to those who need it most. Rishi's plan is very much to target that help at the most vulnerable households. So, for example, pensioner households or people with disabilities or households on the lowest incomes. And I think that's the right way to go. I know this is hard for everybody, but for some people it's really hard and we need to help them get through it. 
International news and residents living near Europe's biggest nuclear facility in Ukraine are being given iodine tablets now amid fears of a nuclear incident. The authorities handed out the medication to both parents and children living close to the D Zaporizhia power station amid intense fighting in the area. That's also as a team from the International Atomic Energy Agency arrived in Ukraine to investigate a Russian-occupied facility saying safety and security must be protected. The Prince of Wales is due to make a donation to the aid charity Islamic Relief to help those affected by flooding in Pakistan. It follows a message from Her Majesty the Queen to the President of the country saying how deeply saddened she was by the tragic loss of life and destruction. Pakistan is appealing for international support now as more than a thousand people have lost their lives so far. The International Monetary Fund is looking into releasing an aid package worth $1.1 billion to help the impacted region. Unusually heavy monsoon rains have caused flooding in both the north and south of the country, destroying farmland and causing problems for more than 30 million people. Britain's biggest warship is limping back to shore following a mechanical issue. HMS Prince of Wales left Portsmouth on Saturday to spend the next three months working with US military partners in the Atlantic. But the carrier is now moving slowly from the Isle of Wight, where it temporarily docked, towards Gosport, where it's now understood the sheltered area will make it easier for divers to examine the extent of the damage to the hull, which is believed to have been I'm not quite sure, actually. I must look into that for you. Now, the family of a 16-year-old boy who died at Leeds Festival have paid tribute to their beautiful and fiercely independent son. David Cellino fell ill whilst at the music event and died yesterday, despite the efforts of paramedics to save him. West Yorkshire Police is investigating whether the teenager had taken ecstasy before his death. The force says it's believed to be an isolated incident. Some refuse collectors will continue to go on strike in Scotland as two unions have rejected the latest offer from the local authorities. The offer made to bin workers, which included a one-off payment of up to £2,000, was rejected by the Unite Union and the GMB Union. One other union group is still in negotiations with the provider, COSLA. Staff in Edinburgh and another of, um, a number of other local administrations across Scotland have all been staging industrial action over the last week in a dispute over pay. That's it. You're up to date on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News, where now it's time for Emily and Deebs & Co. Welcome to Jews & Co. Tonight it's with me, Emily Carver. Michelle is off today for the bank holiday. Anyway, joining me tonight is my superstar panel. I've got Ben Habib, who is a former Brexit Party MEP. Of course he is. He's also the CEO of First Property Group. And Jeevan Sandher on my left. I think he is also on the left of the panel. He's an economist at King's College London. And as usual, of course, we want to hear from you. Please do send in your thoughts. I think we've already got some coming in on the nationalisation and the strikes, of course. So please do get in touch with me throughout the show at gbviews at gbnews.uk. Of course, if you're on Twitter, you can also tweet us at gbnews. Please do tweet me also at Carver Emily. Now, with the 80% increase of the energy price cap announced before the weekend, nearly half of Conservative voters, not Labour voters, Conservative voters, now say they want to re-nationalise the UK's energy industry. This comes at the same time as a Comrades survey reveals nearly one in four adults say they simply will not be turning on their heating this winter. Both the Conservatives and Labour have so far ruled out nationalisation, but it seems the mood may be shifting slightly as people face their bills. Now, is it time for the new Prime Minister to find a radical solution? Could nationalisation be the answer. So, it's been 36 years since British gas was privatised under Margaret Thatcher. Is it time to do the same now? Ben, why are Tory voters, do you think, uh, succumbing to this idea? Well, it's an extraordinary ch turn of events, you know, Tories supporting nationalisation. And I think what we've seen is 
a wholesale expansion of the state, starting with Tony Blair. You know, he launched, in my opinion, the nanny state. Boris Johnson took it to wet nurse status with his lockdowns and furlough schemes and so on. And this seems to be a natural progression in the same direction. People seeing a problem, not standing on their... not willing to stand on their own two feet to face the problem and looking to government to sort it out. How but, can people stand on their own two feet to solve the problem? There's only so much we well, can I'll, do other than turn the heating off. Well, I... I, 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 I I'll come to that, but I think what we what we need in our economy is less state intervention, mm. not more. I think Liz Truss's instinct to cut VAT on, on domestic fuel, to cut green taxes on domestic fuel, that's the right instinct. Cut taxes and allow people to have more money in their pockets so they can make the decisions that they need to make to face the crisis. But the reality of the situation is this. No amount of government intervention, whether you take a print money and hand it out to the public approach or you take a tax-cutting approach, is going to solve this enormous problem that has effectively been created, as I said at the beginning, from too much government interference in the first place. One thing I would add to the tax cuts is to really make this a private sector problem rather than a public sector one to put the ball firmly back in the court uh, of the private sector is to invite the private sector, or indeed insist that the private sector, match the government's tax cuts pound for pound. So the energy companies match the government tax cuts pound for pound. Now, I, th I, I estimate that tax cuts equate to about 15% of what your fuel bill will be this winter. And if you can get the the, uh, the uh, energy companies to make a similar reduction, you actually get an immediate 30% reduction in your fuel bills. That is going to stress the balance sheets of energy companies. They're going to be in real trouble. But they're in the private sector. They have ways, means and so on to plan their way to navigate out of the problem that we would then create for them. What we mustn't do is nationalise them and obviate the pressure that they would otherwise feel to use private sector solutions to address the problem. Yes, I mean, I would agree that the private sector is usually far more efficient and productive than what our Absolutely. governments can do. I can't imagine having some of our cabinet ministers in charge of our energy system. Which ones? Now, now Jeevan, <laughs> which ones? I mean, any. Take your pick. Would you trust any of them to do so? They have been a very competent lot. I think that's very fair to say. <laughs> Get that political point in. <laughs> anyway, I mean, we've seen Gordon Brown. He recently had an intervention, didn't he? I think he wrote a column for The Guardian. And he wrote that we could potentially temporarily nationalise energy companies um, in order to deal with these high bills at the moment. But he didn't really specify, I don't think, whether he would be nationalising the uh, suppliers <laughs> or the producers of energy, because that would be rather tricky, seeing as these companies are multinationals. They are. So the temporary nationalisation, if you look at what you pay in your energy bill at the moment with £3,500 price cap, about £60 of that would be profit going to the energy company. Now, look, you could nationalise and take that £60 off, but it's still not going to help you when your fundamental your energy bill is going to go up by £1,600 and £2,000. Yes, this was £63 of profits go to the suppliers out of the £3,459, <laughs> which is the price cap. So it's a very tiny amount, but to be fair... Uh, to be fair, the VAT and the green levies aren't that big a chunk either. They're not. So actually, put them together, is about £300. Yeah. Now, Ben wants them to match, but of course, the energy company was to match that. They'd all be making a loss. I don't know how long they would last, for example, given you only have £60 of profit in the energy price cap. But even if you put that all together and you put the £300 there, that's still not going to make a dent into what's going to be a massive shock to families. The average family in this country, after tax, takes home about £40,000 they don't have another two grand to pay their energy bill. And so actually, if the state doesn't step in, it's not a question of working harder or doing your sums better. There's just no way to make ends meet. At the moment, 45% of us are cutting back on energy. This winter will be catastrophic if the government doesn't step in. And I would say, actually, this is the point. You freeze the energy price cap for a year, you use windfall and wealth taxes to fund that, and you use that year to get bills down other ways. But, but Jeevan, I think... I, uh, ben, I'll come to you on this, yeah. because I think we may agree on this. I'm worried about this mentality about windfall taxes, because... Um, 
Oil and gas companies are already taxed to the hilt. I believe at the moment it's 65% of their profits go to the Treasury. It's not like these companies don't pay a huge whack. We need these companies to be investing. We've got a supply yeah. crisis. That's the fundamental issue here. That, that, that is the fundamental issue. They pay a 40% a standard corporation tax rate, whereas other companies pay 19%, and now they've had the surcharge of 25%. Although with Rishi, you know, he's micromanaged how they get that, uh, how that tax is levied. But the point here is that you, you, when you tax companies, when you tax individuals, you're putting money into government hands. Government has an appalling track record of dealing with the money that we give them. We don't want our money in their hands. We want more money in our hands. And Liz Truss gets this. That's why she's resisting handouts. She's resisting handouts because that's even more state interference. And there is, I can say with utter certainty, that if the government takes an approach of handing out cash, it's going to get it wrong. It's going to hand out cash the wrong way. The right way to do this is cut back these massive taxes we've got, which, by the way, at a post-war high, cut back state intervention, put the pressure on the private sector, not by taxing their profits, but by ensuring the ta that the private sector come to the table alongside the consumers. Private sector is fantastic at sorting itself out. And while I was at it, and again, I think Liz Truss is on the right lines, I would insist that institutions in this country do not boycott investing in fossil fuel companies. You know, we've got a number of universities. I don't want to name them. I'll be offending my alma Well, the mater. viewers, the viewers <laughs> can look them up on the internet. Yeah, I'm sure. A number of uh, uh, in, in, uh, highly endowed uh, institutions in this country that refuse to invest in fossil fuel companies, uh, insurance companies, pension funds, all refusing to do it. And what they're doing is making the cost of capital for, in, for, for, for fossil fuel companies more expensive. So what I say is. Put the pressure on fossil fuel companies, make them come to the table, and then reduce the pressures on them that they have yeah. in, the, in, in the capital markets created by this drive towards net zero, enabling them to then raise the capital they need through private means to sort the problem out. Now, that was an impassioned speech. It was by an ben. impassioned speech. Do you take his point that government intervention has in part got us to this situation where we don't have the energy security and affordability of supply that we once had. Well, it's the opposite. Um, in terms of net zero targets, in terms of decarbonisation, we've disincentivized exploration for oil and gas, which we need in order to move to our greener, brighter world. It's the opposite, right? So actually what has happened inside our energy usage, for example, the reason why our bills are £150 higher where they should be is because actually we stopped insulating homes in the early 2010s. Our gas storage is lower than it should be because Theresa May didn't keep up our nationalised gas storage in 2017. You talk about private sector companies, but why has gas has gone up so much by five times since early 2021, it's because actually it started to increase beforehand and then Putin's invasion of Russia. There's no amount of private sector wheeling and dealing that can undermine the fundamental fact that no, gas is five times more made, expensive. Haven't you made Ben's point a little bit for him? Because you've just talked about government failure. Now, government has failed to pick winners there. They didn't sort out the gas storage, you've just said, and presumably other renewable sources. So if perhaps the government took a step back but the government did and take allowed, a step back. you it, know, there it, are incentives it, that they can put in place. It didn't even. The government drove an agenda towards net zero. It ideologically turned its back on, oil, uh, on gas reserves in the, in the North Sea. It ideologically turned its back on fracking. The US embraced fracking. The US went from being a net importer of fossil fuels to a net exporter. It is in a much better place as a result. And the United Kingdom, we have a phenomenal amount of natural resource in this country, and we have eschewed it on ideological grounds driven by government policy. The government needs to get out of our way. It needs to reduce taxes on the working class, reduce taxes on the middle class, reduce taxes on business and get out of the way. Can we take up the tax point, for example? So you say we read taxes on individuals, for example, help them deal with this winter. What pensioner will deal? What pensioner will do with an income tax cut? They won't benefit from that. I didn't, the VAT cut I didn't you're talking talk about, about tax. the energy levy you're talking about, that's £300 still. The £2,000 extra. It all adds what would up. you like a pensioner to do? What would you like a pensioner to do when they pay £1,700 of higher bills? What would you like them to do? Even you cannot, this is a problem out of which we will not escape unscathed. The populace is going to be damaged. Yes. Now, isn't this isn't this one of the things that is perhaps a hangover from lockdown? During lockdown, Rishi Sunak was there. 
dishing out the money willy-nilly, making us think that we were all protected from adverse things going on in the world, from even a global pandemic which should have, I mean, if we'd had lockdown policies, essentially put us all on the dole. You know, they protected us. They protected us for so long, and now they have to protect us from this supply shock in terms of our bills. Do you think that perhaps the government is doing too much? We're too reliant on the government, and it's because of the, you know, what we experienced during lockdown. Nowhere near enough. 2.6 million kids are going hungry. 2 million pensioners in poverty. Now, the government isn't doing enough to protect them, and no amount of wishing the way... perhaps if they get, let us keep more of our own them. money... But a pensioner on a fixed income who has a state pension... There is no kind of tax cut that's going to help them. They have a pension and they have an energy bill and that pension will not meet that energy bill. They will but, not meet that right. If you reduce taxes on fuel, you get rid of the green levies, you make sure pounds. the private sector come to the table, you cut VAT by 5%, which is dramatic and which is Liz, Liz Truss is, is considering. You basically reduce the cost of May I just tell viewers that this board. is not a party political broadcast for Liz <laughs> Truss. No, 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 I'm not. But it's so <laughs> refreshing. It's, I follow the Tory party, obviously, very closely all my life. But it's the first time in 12 years I've seen a Tory leader actually espousing traditional Conservative values. Now, I wonder, once Liz Truss, if she is appointed Prime Minister, leader, um, uh, leader of the Conservative Party, whether she'll maintain this ideological stance towards free markets, low taxes, or if she, once she becomes Prime Minister, will face the same problems that every Prime Minister seems to have, which is constant demands on the public purse. I suspect not, given how big pensions are part of her voter base. She absolutely has to give the money, not just morally, but also kind of practically. If she wants to win the next election, she has to hand out the cash. The tax cuts will not get her there. They will not help those pensioners. But pensions. no amount of handing out the cash is going to help either, Jeevan. I'd what, quite like what, it. Help me out. What are you proposing? That the government prints more money? No. That we see sterling depreciating Right, value? now, let's spend. Yeah. Let's... Just sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but we've got to go to our sorry. viewers. <laughs> They've been coming in thick and fast on yeah. this. Let me just zoom into what they're saying. So we've got... And we've got Keith. He says, I would not nationalise the essential services as that would mean them being run by another government body. This is the problem. And frankly, I would not allow trust any MPs or politicians from the Conservative, Labour, Liberals or, heaven forbid, the SNP to run a tap. And now, this is the most compelling argument yeah, yeah. for me, yeah. <laughs> other than history, is that we talk about our politicians in such a negative way. We don't seem to trust them to do anything, yet... Suddenly, those on the left, mostly, want the government to be in control of more, more and more. Where does that come from? Where does that trusting government come from if you don't trust corporates and, you know, business people? It's not about me not trusting them. It's about also, like, I trust the government because the government does do some things pretty well, right? You pay your taxes as and when it comes in your bank account. You have that money distributed out by pensions, by automatic pension payment systems. That's a system that works really well, right? We talked about that windfall tax, for example. You said you don't want the government to have the money. I understand that, but actually what you're saying is what the windfall tax would do is you're going to take that money from those gas and oil producers in the North Sea and send it directly to households. No, That's no, also difficult. No, what, what happens? No, you're missing out a really key step. You tax the oil companies, it goes to government, then they decide how that's distributed. And that's where the screw-up comes. Sorry, forgive me. Um, I think you're allowed to say that <laughs> on air. May I just read out what yeah, Phil has to yeah. say? Because he may... He's contradicting what you've said, Ben. Now, he says, I believe in capitalism. Yeah. Good. This is Phil, sorry. But when it comes to essential utilities, i.e. water, gas, etc., all profits, and I mean every single penny, should go back into the network, not to shareholders. What do you have to say to that? Even if you distributed every penny of profit they make, it wouldn't solve the problem. You know, the profits that we've seen, these shocking profits that Shell and, uh, and BP have been disclosing recently, they're, they're from global operations. Yes. And if you were to distribute them globally to the people, uh, you know, from whom they've made these profits, they would add up to nothing. What we need here is to wean ourselves off this belief that government is going to ride to the rescue every time. Nationalisation, let's just get this straight, nationalisation is just a change of ownership and a change of management. It doesn't get rid of the problem. We didn't get here because power companies, energy companies are being badly run. We got here because the government shut the economy down for intermittently for two years 
and fail to consider what would happen to oil and gas prices when they unlock. They fail to consider what would happen to depleted uh, reserves, to broken manufacturing process, to broken delivery processes, all broken by lockdown. Well, I think that's, that's a crucial point, at least nationalising the suppliers would make absolutely no difference to our bills simply because we buy energy off the market and the price won't change there. Anyway, Elizabeth says, see if you can come back on this one. It's not like government has a good record with regard to running things. Again, it's that question of whether people just simply don't trust the government to, uh, to run anything. But we could ask ourselves why we have off gem, off what? What exactly are they there for? We must have accountability and penalties for poor performance and underinvestment, and it should be investment in the right things, not a net zero agenda. Do you think our regulators are failing us? I think Offwatt has definitely failed us. I mean, look, I think last year, water companies, remember, was £3 billion in profit, and we've seen the literal sewage go into our seas and our beaches, the leakages we have, that awful system of our water, like how terrible that is. Off what has clearly failed to regulate mm. that industry appropriately. And at that point as well, you've got to ask yourself, what are they doing? Like there is a real question about leadership there. Yes, I do think when it comes to water, clearly the regulator doesn't have sharp enough teeth, perhaps, when it comes to holding these um, uh, companies to account anyway. We must move to a break. Coming up though, we've had rail strikes, striking postmen in Scotland. The bin men are also on strike. Now there are calls to coordinate strikes to cause the maximum impact and the most disruption for the rest of us. Should that be allowed even? Coming up after the break. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panellists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. On The Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with The Mark Stein Show. Welcome back to Jeeves & Co. I'm standing in for Michelle today while she takes the bank holiday Monday off. I'm Emily Carver. Now, joining me tonight is my lovely panel, Ben Habib, who is former Brexit Party MEP and also the CEO of First Property Group, so he's got some fine credentials. And also Jeevan Santa, who is an economist at King's College London. Very prestigious too. Oh, well, thank you very a much. Very prestigious panel this evening. So we're going to be talking about strikes because... Well, the threats keep coming. Two of, the Br two of Britain's biggest unions are now calling for all strikes to be coordinated to cause maximum 
impact. It does sound like we're heading towards some kind of autumn winter of discontent. Um, some of you at home may have been around during the 70s. I wasn't, but I've heard what it was like. Anyway, Unison and Unite say working closely together will help them win the fight for inflation-linked pay rises. Mick Lynch, everyone's favourite uh, Chief General Secretary, he's the General Secretary of the RMT, of course, is calling for the entire union movement to act. He's urging unions to vote yes for a wave of industrial action until the spring. That makes me tired thinking about that. Anyway, the list of who is on strike seems to be growing daily. Transport workers, including rail and bus workers, have held a series of strikes. Dock workers in Felix Stowe are currently on strike. Bin men in Scotland are also on strike and postal workers were on strike last week. And there's also a growing list of workers that are considering action. We've got the Royal College of Nursing, who are preparing to consult with their members, as is the GMB Union over teachers' pay. Civil servants and communication workers are also being asked to consider taking strike action. The suggestion to coordinate strikes will be discussed at the TUC Congress next month. Is it right that strikes should be held together? Uh, or will that damage the country even more? People are talking about broken Britain. I think coordinated strikes might well bring us, well, bring us even more into a disaster zone. Now, you've been sending in your opinions all this show already, and we've been reading them out, so we'll come to more later in the show. Now, let's go to you first, Juven. Are you worried about a winter of discontent, or do you think these unions have a right to strike and that, you know, they have a worthy cause. The unions absolutely have a right to strike and they absolutely have a worthy cause. You know, think about nurses you spoke about there. Nurses for a pay cut around £2,000 in the decade up till now. That's why nurses are visiting food banks in this country. They're facing the £1,600 in the year ahead. Let's also remember what nurses went through during this pandemic. Look, despite whatever your views are on what happened during COVID, they're on the front line. They risked their lives for this country. It's shameful that any of them are going to food banks. We've seen this across kind of the sectors as well. BT, for example, made a profit of 500 million, have now offered their workers a pay cut of between 10 and 5%. Their CEO, by the way, got a pay increase of 30% last year as well. We're seeing this across the board. So until workers are paid more to actually be able to live and survive, absolutely unions should be going on strike and should be doing it to cause, or rather to ensure they have higher wages. Now, Jeevan, you're an economist. Yes. So you know that obviously there's only so much money that can go around. Where do you, um, well, do you accept that if we're going to give essentially the entire public sector an inflation busting pay rise, that that money will have to come from somewhere and it may mean God forbid, public spending cuts elsewhere. No, not at all. Well, first and foremost, actually spend the money. And let's be clear, these aren't inflation-busting pay increases they're asking for, right? At the moment, the public sector pay offer is around 5%, so actually a real-term cuts of 8%. These aren't inflation-busting. This is falling even further behind than they were before. One of the reasons why our public sector is in such crisis at the moment, one of the reasons waiting lists are so long, is because we've seen such huge pay cuts. NHS England has about 40,000 nursing vacancies, because it's quite hard to do a job and be a nurse if you can't literally put food on the table. People leave that sector. Ben is a private sector operator. He knows if you don't pay workers enough, they don't come and turn up, they will do other jobs. And so that's what we're seeing. jimin has got a point, doesn't he? We do have a problem seemingly with morale in well, the public sector and a lot of our public services. Now, pay clearly is a massive factor with people leaving certain jobs, leaving the NHS, leaving teaching, leaving the police force. What do we do about this? Well, I mean, Jeevan's absolutely right in the way he laid out his case. And uh, I, I was a big fan of Mick Lynch's at the beginning of these you know, the, the, this industrial action that's been unfolding. You're a fan of Mick Lynch? I was at the beginning. Goodness. But I'm going to come back to Mick I've Lynch. I've never been a fan of Mick Lynch, <laughs> I must admit. Well, I, I have sympathy for the public sector um, workers. You know, if you look at them in the round, over the last... 12 years of Conservative Party government, they've had a pay rise effectively in nominal terms of about 5% leaving out this year. Inflation leaving out this year has been about 25%, now up at about 35% over that period when you take the latest 10% into account. That means they've had a real wage squeeze of around 25 to 30%, depending on how you look at it. That is a massive reduction in real wages. 
And I think Grant Shapps in particular was tin-eared when he was listening to these complaints about the need for, for higher wages. And it all, they almost went back to sort of 1970s confrontational politics without recognising that there is a genuine problem with wages at the moment. I understand that, but of course it was also Mick Lynch who was using the rhetoric of class war, or at least it sounded like that, and he's been again in the press course, yeah. calling and for Mick, I think... rebalance, calling for the billionaires going on about yeah. Eton and Harrow, elite, etc., etc. It's very much about mobilising that started sentiment. Well. Mick started well. He had my sympathy. And, and the working class, by the way, have, I, for what it's worth, personally, I have a huge amount of sympathy with the position they're in. And it comes back to 12 years of no growth in the economy, but I won't talk about that at the moment. But that's a fundamental problem. But Mick Lynch has gone over the top now. He's now calling for this general strike. It's, it, there's nothing to warrant a general strike across all sectors coordinated to cause maximum damage to the populace. That is not what he should be doing. He does have an 8% pay offer on the table. It might come with restrictions, but it also comes with the promise of no redundancies for two years. He should now back off. Well, this is what frustrates me. It's not that um, people in unions who people who work hard in the public sector want pay rises. Of course they do. Um, we're all being hit by inflation, some more than others, of course. But isn't the key problem that in a lot of these areas, productivity just isn't there? You know, asking for no redundancies as a rule. You can't do that in the private sector. If a business like rail isn't making the revenues that it was before, for example, uh, revenues still, I think, are about 80% of what they were pre-pandemic, then surely cuts need to be made. So rail is subsidised in any case. We've also seen the rail operators, those who actually use the trains, are actually making profits at this point in time. So what's actually happening is you and I and the people at home as taxpayers are paying money into people like First Group, for example, and subsidising their profits. So there is absolutely money there to be paid. Now, the RMT offer at the moment, we should claim that's not 8%, it's 4% this year and 4% next year. So it's a 4% pay offer, not an 8% pay offer, after their pandemic pay freeze. And look, if you want to know how, like, if one sense worthy their call I mean, Ben Habib here is saying that, yes, workers should be being paid more. Ben Habib is agreeing with the aims of the union movement. Like, that's what a shocking state we're in. And I can't believe that Ben supports this. Like, I'm, I'm well, quite no, surprised. No, but, no, but, no but, sh but surely, with higher pay, must come reform of our services. The wastage that people talk about, the bureaucracy, the productivity gains that aren't happening. Absolutely. Uh, There's got to be strings attached, is what I'm saying. We, we, we've got to move forward. Uh, you know, technologically, as a country, and part of technological advancement is improving product. Comes, you know, results in the improvement of productivity, which you rightly cited, has been awful for 12 years. I mean, part of the reason for that—I don't want to go back to the European Union—but part of the reason for that was we had very cheap, unskilled labour on whom large businesses and public sector could rely to fill the gap, and there was no drive towards innovation. Actually, now we have a phenomenal incentive to innovate, and we do need the public sector to come along with it. Yes, wages have to go up at the moment. Sadly, actually, if Rishi had got ahead of the problem and he'd cut national insurance instead of raising it, he'd cut VAT earlier, cut taxes on fuel earlier, actually the burden that these workers felt on their shoulders coming into 2022 would have been much lessened. And it's not 2020 hindsight that allows me to say this. A lot of us, including myself, were saying this last year. Rishi, you've got to cut taxes on, 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 the, on the act of doing business. You've got to ta cut taxes on turnover. VAT is a classic one, which, again, I don't want to go back to Liz Truss because you're going to mm -hmm. think I'm making another party political broadcast, which I'm not, <laughs> uh, because I'm not even a member of the Conservative Party. But it is the right thinking to cut back VAT because it's a tax on... But hang on now, because both of you, you know, you'd be a bit soft on the unions. You think the government perhaps should be listening a little bit more. But what about the average Joe? trying to get to work, they can't use the rail. Absolutely. They don't have the bargaining power with the company they work for. A lot of these unions represent not the lowest paid workers in the economy at all. Those are the people working in hospitality or working um, uh, uh, menial jobs in the private sector, cleaners, etc., etc., who don't have this bargaining power and they're the ones who are being hit by this disruption. They're not getting high pay rises either. Maybe if they were unionised, they will. Maybe we should go and help them to get unionised <laughs> and be represented, right? That's the reason why pay is so poor in those sectors, why they haven't seen such growth. I'll tell Absolutely. You how, I, I'd like I to think, more I think, may yeah. I just say, I think we need to go... I think the government will 
can't be seen to give in to every demand. It would just be the cost of that. I mean, our country would potentially go bankrupt if we were to give in to every single union demand. Of course, in other countries, in the European Union, which is seen as very civilised, there are minimum service agreements, there are restrictions on ballots that make it harder for people to essentially bring the country to a halt. That's that view. However, I do have sympathy, of course, with people who are struggling to make ends meet at the moment, and that's a huge amount of people in this country, as we saw in the earlier segment. One in four are considering not turning the heating on this winter, um, which would be impossibly cold in large parts of our country. Anyway, let's have a look at what you think. Perhaps you think I'm being too harsh or too kind. Who knows? Here we go. We've got... We have got Chris. I used to think that the unions were becoming more sensible in their approach and indeed sensitive to the general needs of the public. How wrong I am. The unions are run by idiots. Now, I think, you know, a lot of the people in unions are older workers and um, uh, largely male. Do you think that unions actually aren't really representing that many people in this country now? Well, I'm a trade union member. I'm quite young. Yeah, but you would be. Jesus. Yeah, but... <laughs> You're a left-wing economist. You've got to be. You've got to be. <laughs> I think, look, I think trade unions absolutely represent their entire kind of membership, and they're also very democratically run. Should I join run. a trade union? Absolutely, you should join a trade union. I'm can not I, sure what DB News' can I, union can is. Can I just jump in here? Mick Lynch trades not just on the popularity within his own union, but the, trades also on his popularity in the country. What people like Mick Lynch should now be doing is not calling for a general strike. What Mick should be doing is declaring a truce over winter. If he wants support from the public, if he wants sympathy in government, he should be saying, we are in a terrible place as a country, we'll take the offer on the table, we, we reserve the right to come back to that, 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 that offer in April next year when we're through winter, but during the course of the next eight months, we, as responsible members of the workforce of this country, are going to see the country through a potential winter of discontent. And he would have national support Well, this for is that. the thing. A lot of people look at the likes of Mick Lynch and think, you know what, this man just isn't willing to compromise. And it's worth noting that only 23% of workers are in a union. So they are quite a privileged section of uh, the workforce in that respect anyway. At least they have more bargaining power than the average. Um, let's have a look. Peter says you should never remove the right for a worker to withdraw their labour. That is how slavery operates. Of course, for a lot of people, if they withdraw their labour, they'll simply get the sack. I mean, if I decided to just walk out tomorrow and not come and present if I was booked to, um, I guess I'd just be shown the door. Depends if you strike or not, or who your union is. But if you do have, if a strike is voted on, of course, you would have the right to withdraw your labour. I mean, it should be clear about union ballots. You have to get a 50% approval on a 50% turnout. So RMT got about 60%. I thought it was lower 60%. than that. It's 50% on 50%. Okay. The RMT got 60% of their members to approve. The Conservative Party in this country got 40% of the country to vote for them. Also, trade union <laughs> ballots have to be done by paper. You can't vote electronically in a trade union ballot, unlike the Conservative Party leadership context, Do you know what I think? The, the crucial point here, <laughs> and one that has to, has to be made time and time again, is why we're in this position. Why public sector workers feel so underpaid at the moment is, of course, because of inflation. And inflation, you could blame that on the Bank of England, who were arguably asleep at the wheel while we were pumping huge amounts of money into our economy and having billions of pounds worth of stimulus Add on to that, of course, the supply shock in terms of gas. And we're in this sticky situation where people's money isn't going very far. Inflation is the killer, isn't it, but, really? But it, but it all comes back to lockdown. You know, when, when, when we locked down the economy, we took what is a very finely balanced global system and absolutely trashed it. And we put a sticking plaster on it by printing money. 500 billion in total was printed during the course of the last two years. And that gave us the feeling that everything was OK. But people like me were jumping up and down in March 2020, saying this is going to be a disaster. And we were shouted down. Um, and the I was jumping up and down, um, <laughs> but no one was watching or listening. Um, yes, and that's what, we did that's, that's pump too we much are. money into the economy. It's hardly surprising that we have such high inflation, is it? We printed a lot of cash. And like I think the Bank of England didn't take, or rather, I could see why they made that emergency decision. I'm not sure what decision I would have made if I was at that point in time. But also Maybe one day you'll be 
Let's economist see. in the Bank of England. Let's see what happens. But, Mike, but they should have Mike, withdrawn that cash Mike, much more quickly. Anyway, Mike, we have just, to. Can I say one thing? Very, very quickly. Yeah, by all means, not by all means, if you insist on shutting the economy down, you've got to have a vision and an economic plan to open the economy up. You can't just open it up and just assume it's going to go back to normal. That's what they did. They gave the private sector no support. They didn't think about all the effects that would be inflationary. They just didn't think well, it through. Well, to be fair, they did taper off slowly the furlough payments, so businesses were still getting that in terms of their staffing, at least. Anyway, coming up, we did move a little bit off strikes there, but I think it's still relevant. Anyway, coming up, they have a baton and CS spray, but should all police be issued with tasers as standard? I've never seen a police officer use a taser, um, but I imagine it hurts a lot. Has an increase in street violence stretched the thin blue, blue line to breaking point? Coming up after the break. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness, me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Jeeves & Co with me, Emily Carver. On my panel tonight is, of course, Ben Habib, a former Brexit Party MEP and also the CEO of First Property Group. There he is. And Jeevan Sandher, who is an economist at King's College London, which is another fine institution. So, the Chief Constable of Northamptonshire says every police officer should have a taser as part of their standard kit. Nick Adderley has already given the order for all his frontline officers to have the 50,000-volt stun guns. Wow, that sounds very powerful. And he hopes other police forces will follow suit. Now, is it negligent for police officers not to have tasers when fighting crime? You've been sending in your opinion, so please do keep them coming. Now, police officers do sometimes have a bit of a tough time, don't they, Ben? Um, I think I've been looking at my stats today, of course I have, and in the year ending March 2021, there were almost 37,000 assaults on police officers just in England and Wales in one year. Well, do they need tasers to protect themselves? Well, uh, I, I mean, it's a funny concept, isn't it, to arm the police to protect themselves when actually only 7% of serious crime results in an arrest. Mm. I mean, I don't think the issue with the police force is the inability to stamp their authority on people. I think the problem with our police force at the moment is that it's politicised and actually doesn't want to do its job. I know that, that might come across a bit, uh, as a bit harsh. Do you mean but... too much dancing at Pride? And yeah, too, too much... much, you know, and people might say, well, Ben, for God's sake, mellow out. It was just one dance and the Macarena is <laughs> quite good fun and it's building relations with the community. But I don't want my police force to be um, 
members and supportive of a particular minority interest group. I want my police force to be respectable enforcers of the law and to in, and, and effectively to enforce the law blind. You know, they need to be respected in their local communities, not liked. And that yes. is the issue that I think that, you know, at the heart of, uh, of the problem of the police force at the moment. I don't think giving them guns is going to help. All we're going to do is end up... With well, not guns, a... taser guns. Yeah, well, sort of... Hell, not, with, you know. not with a bullet. Um, yeah. But this is a problem with our police force. Before we go back to the tasers, uh, just to Ben's point about that trust and priorities. Because, I mean, my parents, they had their car nicked out of their drive a couple nights ago in the middle of the night, just stolen. Um, and I don't suppose the police have been round or will do much. Apparently only 1% of car thefts actually end with a conviction of sorts. All you get is a, is a number to give to your insurance. Yeah, the problem with the, with the police force, we had such huge cuts, 20,000 fewer police officers. If we want to get crime down, we do need to have more police. Do you think it's just cuts that are to blame? Or do you think there's a culture problem? I mean, there are other culture problems we've seen, certainly within the Metropolitan Police. I would disagree with Ben slightly, actually. I'd say the policemen should be both respected and liked within their community. But they not should feared? Be... Should they be feared? I, what does fear mean? I don't know if you want to fear... I want well, to see like a policeman... you fear your parents' wrath as a child, perhaps. I don't want to fear a policeman as I walk down the street. I want to have a good relationship. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm intrigued you think they should be liked, because the pursuit of popularity is the dumbing down of respect. You know, when you pursue popularity, what you're doing is pandering to minority groups. You're pandering to the group that you should be actually policing. And that's not what I want from my police force. I want to know that they, uh, they're going to enforce the law, that they're trustworthy, and that they are blind to my skin colour, my, my religion, my, my ethnic background, you know, all those things. They need to be blind to all of that, and they just need to look at the enforcement of the law. That's it. Was I... that not Boris Johnson's fatal flaw, that he wanted to be liked, so it stopped him from making sound decisions? Absolutely right. I think Boris Johnson had lots and lots of flaws <laughs> apart from that, but also... But could that be similar with the police? I don't... Look, I think actually the police do have to do a very difficult job, an incredibly dangerous job at times. They don't have times. to take the knee and I think... go to pride marches, do they? They can do, and when they do do, I suspect that actually they become more part of their community. Like, but I do believe community them. policing is part <laughs> by consent. <laughs> Consent. So do you think tasers would be a step towards an authoritarianism that we don't want on our streets? I think it's... I'm not sure it is the answer. Like, I'd like to see an operational review. I don't want to make, like, decisions about tactics of police You're on officers. The fence a bit. I am. I am open to see what the evidence says. I'd also say that 500 people in the United States have been killed with tasers over the past 20 years. So I don't think it's just a case of... Is that we from give people the taser tasers. or...? Was that one of the one of the causes? Well, I suspect if you have a taser to the chest, you have a heart attack. Yes, you may have a pre-existing heart condition, but I suspect the taser would be the proximate cause. So I don't think it's a costless decision, certainly. Mm. And I also don't think it's going to really... Or I'm not sure it's gonna, how it's going to get down crime. You know, tougher sentences, more tasers, they might sound like it's going to be something that works, but actually, will it work? I mean, in practice, if... I mean, we've seen the horrific cases in Liverpool recently with gun crime, but I imagine if I was at home and I felt um, under attack for whatever reason from a criminal of sorts, if a police officer had a taser and they were able to quickly bring him down, I think I would very much welcome that myself. But, Ben, I've been doing my research and tasers, of course, have been used against disabled people. We saw recently a 93-year-old man with dementia. Didn't he die? I think, believe he yeah, died. Yeah. I don't know if it was uh, because of the taser or if that was one of the, uh, you know, it's like with, a taser. with... It was a factor, you know, <laughs> with COVID or without... Or, you but know. can you imagine using a taser on a disabled 93-year-old man? I mean, it does sound barbaric. It's but utterly, I don't know what they were thinking. Of course, he was wielding a knife but, but still, I can't see you know. where the, <laughs> the cost-benefit analysis there was a little yeah. bit off, I would say. But this particular police officer has given tasers to all of his serving police officers, police staff. Um, perhaps he, with his experience, believes that police officers need this now. So, yeah, we'll have to see what the evaluation ends up saying. Does it actually... Does the police feel they need it and why do they feel they need it? And we'll see what kind of the figures say. Like, I think it would be irresponsible of me to say what an operational decision that a police officer has to make. You know, what happens when someone is wielding a knife or is threatening somebody else? 
I'm not a police officer, I don't know what that's like, but I imagine that's a very dangerous situation. And so for me to sit here and say yes, no to operational decisions doesn't seem to me to be like the right place to be. I would like our police force not to have to deal with so much fiddly and clumsy legislation like around hate crimes, hate incidents, online everything bill, that's you know. online harms bill that yeah. may well be coming our way, making it more and more difficult for the police to essentially do their jobs because they have to be policing Twitter now, you know, oh, yeah. if I if I go on Twitter and I post something that may be offensive to someone, that could, if the online harms bill goes through, that could be illegal. And then that's more time for police officers. At some point, we can't really be policing offence. And you know what? When I see pictures of police officers having fun outside, I don't get too grumpy about it, but I remember the Extinction Rebellion protests. Um, that was painful to watch when the police were joining in. There's clearly some political you know, political causes that they back and some that they don't. And you see, um, you see them handing out water to people who've uh, glued themselves to the road, obstructing... Oh, yes, traffic. they should have just ripped, ripped you know, them off the road, them off the road and... Can we go to just one, yeah. maybe one or two viewers uh, here? Let me just scroll. What have we got? Right, James says, I would give all police guns, especially in London, but the way the country is going, they will all need them soon. Great. Uh, that's a bit of a bleak picture uh, James paints there. Linda in Leeds says, yes, the police should have tasers. The police put their lives on the line every day. I just wish, that, wish there were more police because in Leeds it feels lawless. That's the problem, just the numbers, isn't it? It's just the numbers, they aren't there. Bobby's on the beat. And Phil says, Emily, are the tasers going to be rainbow coloured? <laughs> I mean, there is a bit of an obsession with diversity and inclusion, isn't there? I'm not. I mean, look, I quite like a police force that welcomes the diversity. Oh, culture. you're such a softie. Yeah. <laughs> you're such a softie. I think that is. Anyway, that is all we've got time for, I think, um, today. But thank you very much for tuning in. I believe it is Nigel Farage who will be joining us next. Um, you've been sending in all your views now. We can go to Nigel now. Thanks for watching. I think we've got Nigel there. Hello, Nigel. Thank you very much. What Hello, are you going to be talking thank about tonight? Thank you. We're going to have a debate because Boris Johnson is pleading for his green legacy to be protected, for net zero to stay, for the green energy projects, wind farms to continue. We'll debate, should Boris's green energy project stay on track or is it time for a pause and a rethink? But before all of that, let's get the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's uh, weather picture, the UK is looking largely dry with the best of the late sunshine in the south and west. Uh, the details for you, a fine end to the day across southwest England, it's still breezy along the south coast but dry for all with some brightness ahead of uh, dusk. Temperatures around 21 degrees Celsius, dry to end the day for much of southeast England and London with sunny spells and a light northeasterly breeze. Temperatures nudging 20 degrees Celsius. Plenty of late evening sunshine ahead of dusk. A gentle northeasterly breeze in prospect. Temperatures across South Wales will sit at a pleasant 21 degrees Celsius. A dry evening to come across the Midlands. Plenty of sunny spells to end the day. Some cloud we think will float through on a light northeasterly wind. Temperatures sat at 19 Celsius. A few glimmers of late evening sunshine across the northeast of England.